All right. I'm happy to announce that our Rust video conferencing system is finally out. It is free as in freedom, and it supports an army of thousands of concurrent meeting attendants. Of course, we are sharing our Kate's config and Helm charts so that you can host it on your own servers. Or you can make life easy and use the publicly available website at rustlemania.com. Pretty much, you can do whatever you want and distribute it to anybody in the entire world. Our tech stack is simple. A web-first video conferencing system using bleeding-edge browser technologies like Wasm, Web Codex, Web Transport, with a very simple protobuf API to exchange media. And of course, it is entirely written in Rust. We are focusing our efforts on Chromium and Chromium-like browsers like Chrome and Edge because our system relies on Web Codex and Web Transport support. As more browsers implement these libraries, we will add them to the roster. Best of all, our system is 100% open source. Unlike services like Nginx that keep the good stuff for paid versions, we believe in the power of open source and make all our work available on GitHub. You can check out our codebase here. We announced the launch in both the official Rust forum and on Reddit. You know how it is on Reddit. It's a real roller coaster. Either the devoted Rust stations will rally behind your post or they do not hesitate to downvote it into oblivion. But here's the thing. Even when this was not our first rodeo, the community didn't just give us a pat on the back. They showered us with overwhelmingly positive support. Let's put some of these comments under the spotlight. Is this not end-to-end -end encrypted or are you referring to the metadata? We are on the same page here. Security is a non-negotiable in this community. As of now, the transport layer, both in the web transport and the web socket modes, are secure with TLS 1.3. We do plan to release end-to-end -end encryption this summer. The question is why? There are so many conferencing systems out there. Why do we need this? My response is that I did not find a single system that uses the latest, greatest web technologies like Web Transport, Web Codex, and Wasm. Also, I want to become an expert in media streaming. Running our own conferencing system at scale is a great step towards achieving this. Don't you think that Meeting.rs is the simplest solution regarding peer-to-peer -peer conference? So I looked at the repo and it looks great. Instead of you or Leptos, it seems like this system uses a pure JavaScript solution with an HTML frontend and they use Wasm to handle the WebRTC connections. However, I did not find a hosted version. Also, the fact that it only supports two peers is rather confusing. I know for a fact that WebRTC is capable of handling multiple peer connections. But again, I think this is a perfectly fine solution. So, regarding our statement that you know, we feel strongly that the world needs a standard open source video and audio streaming system and we aim to cover that gap. Kekon says that he's just thinking about this meme. <laughs> I, listen, I you have a point there. I, yep, I'm with you. I think you are absolutely right. Before trying to implement something new, you need to look at what's out there. And I believe that we did perform our due diligence and we just didn't find anything that appealed to us. After releasing the article, one of the authors of Mock or Media Over Quick reached out. Obviously, I did not check with them if they wanted to be mentioned, so their identity will remain anonymous. And they are in the draft stage, so this is probably going to take a few years to get implemented. But yeah, uh, the protocol looks really interesting and let me read a portion of the document. Media Over Quick will develop a simple, low-latency media delivery solution for ingest and distribution of media. This solution addresses use cases including live streaming, game, and media conferencing and will scale efficiently. The solution will be implementable in both browser and non-browser endpoints. So I'll continue to read the spec, look at the implementation that you shared. Yeah, heck yeah, I mean, obviously you want to go with the standards because if you follow the standards, then all for the sudden your technology is supported by, uh, you know, browsers, uh, uh, mobile phones and so on and so forth. So yeah, heck yeah, it's in our best interest to do this. I want to make sure that end-to-end -end encryption is supported as well. You know, I just need to learn more about the, the standard. We encountered quite a few hurdles on our journey. For one, we had to build our own web transport and WebSocket libraries for the U framework. We also added web transport support to the H3 crate. After that, 
we created our own H3 fork that is actively maintained and has support for web transport. Furthermore, learning how to host UDP services on Kate's clusters, defining new UDP load balancers, and navigating the health checks was a steep learning curve, especially since Nginx Ingress does not support UDP or HTTP3. However, as of June 1st, 2023, Nginx seems to be on the brink of supporting HTTP3. They just merged the HTTP3 branch back to the baseline. I know that this channel is pretty small, but it turns out that we do have a lot of subscribers from the tech industry. So I need to be very careful with what I am about to say. Listen, Google Cloud is pretty fantastic. I built several projects on it and overall I do like it, but the fact that Google Cloud decided to turn off the Kubernetes dashboard by default is just terrible for customers. Literally, Google Cloud is trying to reinvent the wheel by hiding the Kate's dashboard and instead using their customized tools to manage the cluster. We wasted more than five days trying to figure out why our UDP load balancer was not routing all the requests to our web transport server. At some point, my friend Griffin decided to give DigitalOcean a chance. Because we use Helm charts, Griffin was able to stand the Russellmania cluster in literally just one day. Then he faced the same issues. Many of the web transport requests were failing. It seemed like the load balancer was just throwing away the request. But this time something was different. We had raw access to the awesome Kate's dashboard. Just by clicking on the services, he was able to spot the problem. So check this out. It turns out that the UDP load balancer was sending some of the web transport requests to both the UI and to the WebSocket API. The problem was that all our pods were annotated with the same label. So all we did is to create two labels, one for the WebSocket API and another one for web transport. We applied the change, verified the load balancer, and we see that only the web transport pods are receiving the UDP request, which is exactly what we expect. I hope that the Google Cloud team reconsiders turning back on the Kate's dashboards by default, as opposed to trying to get us to adopt their proprietary and overall just inferior UI. Luckily, there's a manual way to install Kate's dashboards. I'll leave the link in the first comment. To enable web transport, you need to pass the feature flag to the URL. Special shout out to Leon and Ronan for their invaluable contributions, particularly their work on refactoring the monolithic components into a proper model view, view model architecture. Looking ahead, we have big plans for this system. We will turn on end-to-end -end encryption and make a video about it. We want to make it easy for more devices and people to use our teleconferencing system with the goal of becoming the standard for IoT real-time audio and video streaming. Imagine moving your real-time Arlo streaming system to user protocol. The possibilities are endless. We welcome feedback and contributions from the community. Let's make this system the best it can be together.